So uh, before starting to, uh, today's lecture, which will be about uh, Margulis super rigidity, um, I want to uh, say some remark that I missed last time when I discussed lattices in product. I gave a proof for lattices in product of two groups. Uh, basically, the same uh, proof works for uh, lattices in arbitrary number of uh, groups. One can also take restricted product of some uh, infinite family of some kind, but doesn't really matter. Uh, but there is an important issue here, is that uh, we don't have examples uh, for such lattices, unless for arithmetic groups, which are, uh, then we can, I don't know, take, uh, I mean, then, then there are many examples uh, coming from arithmeticity. Uh, but so maybe being a lattice in product of three groups already is so rigid, so it implies arithmeticity. We don't know it. That's an open problem. In, uh, for product of uh, two groups, there are examples which are not arithmetics. Uh, first example that I'm aware of uh, were uh, constructed by uh, Danny Wise and uh, independently by uh, Burger Moses, uh, who proved simplicity of uh, such uh, groups acting on product of some of uh, such groups acting on product of trees. And there are uh, the class of uh, katz moody groups defined over finite fields, uh, studied by uh, Remy and Capras Remy. Uh, also, uh, one can prove simplicity of such uh, groups in many occasions. So this is very interesting. And somehow, uh, in a sense, complementary to those groups uh, acting on A to tilde buildings that I discussed uh, also last time, and all these groups are uh, acting on product of buildings or product of trees, which are buildings as well. So somehow there is a, a related ge a geometric theory behind the scene, which is related to the semi-simple world in, in a certain sense, uh, which we do not yet fully understand. Uh, but this is about that, and I want to start with today's talk. And today uh, we'll uh, present a proof of uh, Margulis super rigidity for simple groups of higher rank. Um, but for this, I already, I mean, I already gave some, uh, at an attempt for proving this, and you saw that we can just go uh, several uh, non-trivial steps towards just by considering this category of representation that we studied uh, last time. But I will uh, add uh, a new layer of complexity of this, uh, of this category, uh, and by this I will gain actually uh, a very simple proof eventually. So the uh, title now is a new category of representation. So again, I ask you to uh, bear with me with some uh, general nonsense stuff. So previously, we uh, represented a, a ergodic space X. Now we will not take arbitrary uh, x, our uh, space that we represent will be the locally compact group S itself, thought of as a, a space. So we start with a locally compact second countable uh, group S, and we consider uh, it as a space uh, on which uh, groups act on left and on, on right simultaneously. So we, I'll denote for a reason, uh, a left acting group by gamma and the right acting group by T, uh, closed subgroups. Um, and I will fix also an algebraic K group uh, G, K is a local field, as usually. Uh, and a continuous homomorphism from gamma to G. That's a representation of the group gamma. And I will study a representation of this feature in the following form. Uh, now I will vary uh, as before with suggestive notation, a KG space V, that will be the recipient of the representation. 
So I will take a group of automorphism of V uh, commuting with G. Which is uh, a K group by itself. I mean, the automorphism group of, uh, of V in general is not a, a, an algebraic group. I mean, it could be a, some sort of an infinite dimensional feature, but uh, I'll take a, an algebraic subgroup of it. <clears throat> and um, I will have a, a representation. Theta. So gamma and T are not symmetric. Uh, for gamma, I fix the homomorphism. And for T, uh, the homomorphism to L will be part of the varying uh, structure. And V will be a G times L space, as you see here. And uh, S. That's a measured space for me. It acted upon by gamma and T. And the heart of this construction I'm giving is this map phi, which should be equivalent with respect to the G times L action via rho times theta. This is a measurable map only. So it does not. So phi does not a priori uh, respect the S group structure, only in parts. It respects the gamma structure on the left and the T structure on the right. So it, it sees some pieces of, of the full equivari equivalence that I might want to, to gain. Uh, somehow the game will be that I want to prove super rigidity result. I'm starting with rho. I want a map from S to G and I will have it by pieces, I start with maps from T groups, which are small in S, uh, to some algebraic groups, and somehow I will enhance this structure using these uh, tricks of commutativity that we played before. Uh, so uh, all these are objects in this category uh, of representation that we study, and morphisms will be given by uh, this uh, more or less same uh, diagram that we had before. I replace previous guy x by s, and now I'll have v, and maybe another u. And, and here I have, just to remind ourselves, the action of this one, g times l1, g times l2 maps, and the diagram is a covariant, and a morphism is this alpha, which is a, a kg map. Morphism of varieties. As we had before. Uh, and of course, alpha could, should be gamma times t equivalence by, uh, by this, uh, by commutation. And um, okay, so here I didn't assume much yet on, on this thing. I didn't inject ergodicity just to get this. Uh, but now I'm about to make some assumption and get some theorems. But first of all, is this uh, world of representation clear? Yes, please. So then what's the relation between L1 and L2? Uh, a priori, no relations. I mean, I can always find, maybe I'll put it into, uh, I can always uh, find map. I mean, I can always pretend that there is a group here, uh, and it's a recipient of uh, the product representation. And I, in fact, I can take the Zerisi closure of T inside. Uh, but um, I don't uh, insist on any a priori relation. So let me uh, erase this, though. Just not to confuse the, us with the picture. Uh, so, but, but this diagram w needs to, to obey the, the, the t-commutativity as well. Yes, the t-covariancy. 
thank you for asking. Um, okay, so now again, uh, we should. I want to emphasize that this is a space for me. And um, I mean, of course, it has some extra structure that we, we will use. Uh, and in principle, I could develop this uh, for other spaces on which I have by actions, commuting actions. And this is reasonable, but I, I, I restrict myself to this for simplicity. Also, one can play with definition and make theta part of the invariant structure, etc. I mean, one can play many games, but this is the game that uh, we, find, we found useful eventually. So uh, we stick to this category of representations. Okay, now uh, a theorem. If gamma uh, is a lattice, so S mod gamma is a, a, a PMP space, and the action of T on S mod gamma, ah, I'm writing it left to right, but it should be somehow in conceptually right to left uh, action, uh, is ME classically what we call weekly mixing, then uh, you should remember that we don't have uh, representations of this x, t representation of this x. That's what we gain from weekly mixing. Uh, and it will follow that uh, there exists an initial object. gate in this category uh, and it's a, of the form S goes to it will be a coset space uh, and here I have G and as usual I'll have this, this one here and gamma times T rho times theta here, of course, for some H0 and G, K algebraic, and that's what I claim. So we need uh, a bit stronger of this assumption that we had before. We need weekly mixing. But uh, sometimes, you remember our discussion in semi-simple Lie groups uh, setting, uh, we have uh, weekly mixing for free. So this is not an issue. Uh, and I will give you the proof. Uh, but uh, you already know the techniques. Uh, it's the same all over. Uh, so since I expect Maybe you don't see it from the very start, but I expect the, the reception to be just a coset, a coset G space. So what I need is just to look at possible ages that uh, can, can, can be uh, put there. So uh, I look at all age. K group. Um, early, right, uh, the full, uh, such that there exists uh, N um, stands for the normalizer of age. Uh, I mean, I, I will not write down in details so you understand this. Uh, and such that I can put this structure on. That's a big collection. And of course, G is inside it. It's a non-empty collection because I always have the trivial representation. And I'll take H0, a minimal element. 
and I will try to convince you that uh, this one will be uh, good for us as before. So uh, as I did uh, at some point in the past, I will now uh, try to uh, illustrate a diagram of S representation. I will not write the S and the arrows inside it, uh, just the, the recipients of the representation in a natural way. Uh, and it will be basically the same diagram that uh, we, we used when we discussed uh, the existence of initial object in a previous category. Uh, only, of course, uh, I, I will have to argue uh, further about some things. So first of all, I have uh, ah. now fix. I need to fix. I'm sorry, uh, some representation uh, with the extra decoration that I'm not putting. I'm fixing some representation v, and I'm trying to explain that g mod h zero will have a map to v. Uh, is this clear? I mean, what I'm trying to do. We've seen this before. So here is v. And here is g mod h0. And again, our task is to construct an arrow, right to left. And as before, I'll put here g mod h0, the product space. And I will have the product representation into them. The L reception of t will be the product of Ls. Again, I, I'm not putting it into the picture. But uh, uh, that will be the, the thing. And now, uh, here is the non-trivial part, maybe. Uh, so you see, uh, T act ergodically on S mod gamma. It acts weakly mixing, which implies ergodically. So uh, T times gamma act ergodically on S. So this is an ergodic thing that I'm representing into V, which is a G times L variety. What I'll get here is a G times L corset space inside, which receive a map from S. The, ergo, the T times gamma ergodic measure on S, when sent to this variety, will hit one orbit. My problem is that this is not a G orbit. It's a G times L orbit. But this I will uh, resolve uh, by this extra ergodicity assumption that I put there. Okay? But so far, I'm having this uh, diagram. And now uh, I need then some discussion. So uh, let me uh, then put the map, which it's not explicit here, into G times L mod M uh, forward. And again, M. M here is a subgroup of G times L and take uh, call it pi, the map to L. So he, in here I have pi M. Um, and now let's project on this uh, L coordinate. So the result of the projection will be uh, this thing. L mod pi m. I just somehow took the space of G orbits in here. Uh, but G was the reception of the gamma action. So this will factor from, uh, maybe I should write it on the left just to be clear. This will factor from S mod gamma. And this will be a, a T-rep. You see it. Uh, now this is T acts on here weakly mixing. Uh, and weakly mixing implies uh, every rep is constant. I was emphasizing it uh, very much in, in the past. Uh, so this means that this is uh, the image is just a point in here, a T invariant. Uh, T 
invariant point. And this is a trick that uh, we were using many times and I will use in the future, so, but let me remind you. Uh, the point is T invariant, so also it's invariant under uh, T bar. Ah. Uh, now I guess that I missed something. Excuse me. Forgive me. I want to assume always that uh, the map theta is risky dense in T. This is really not a restriction. Uh, I'm just, uh, my L guy is kind of a free uh, player. I'm, I'm just taking an algebraic representation of T and there's a risky closure of it as my L. Sorry for not writing it from the very start. But now, after having it, uh, you see that, uh, I mean, I used, here there's a risky closure of uh, T, and uh, this point now is L invariant. Now this, is, this justifies this equation. Uh, so this means that pi m is t. Uh, pi m, excuse me, is L. I have an equation here. Okay, I will. And this means that uh, the G action on L times M, or on this on G times L mod M is transitive. Uh, so this space as a G space. is just G mod H for some H. So I plug this information in here. This is G mod H. With this extra information, I'm coming back to the basic diagram and somehow now I can complete it in the way I would and I did uh, uh, in the past. So we found that this is a, a a G space, this is G mod H, and this H is one of these guys that I was looking at here. Uh, H, maybe I'll give a color. Uh, now H is in C, in the collection C. And now I'm getting this map here. And by minimality, I'm getting that this is an isomorphism. That's what we had before. And then I can climb this isomorphism back and project myself onto V, and I find myself this map. And uh, this is the proof. Any question about it? It's not so hard, there is, there is a trick here played by uh, some algebraic game, but really what's behind it is that there are no algebraic representation mod gamma. This means that uh, somehow the, the G part sees it all, and uh, we have transitivity, and this collection, I mean, if I, if I would try to minimize over the M's in G times L when L is arbitrary and its dimension could grow arbitrarily, I would fail. So I really need this extra ergodistic assumption, but now I have a, a restricted a, a subset of, a, of ages, all living inside same space G, for which I can uh, apply Netherianity. And we win. Okay. Um, so again, we prove this theorem. And now uh, I want to apply it in a suitable uh, context, but before this, I want to remind uh, we need sometimes 
uh, an engine uh, to uh, uh, to our I mean a starter to our uh, then engine. So uh, here is a theorem: if father t uh, is amenable. And the action of gamma on S mod T is then amenable. That's for free. But I want to assume further that it is ME. Again, something that I told you that uh, I get for free in the semi simple world, uh, in a semi simple setting. Uh, and if. Uh, G is, sim is case simple, and my map rho is uh, unbounded, which means the image of gamma is not precompact. Then we get non triviality. These are all assumptions to get that this H0 here, I mean, G mod H0 is not a point. And the proof is very easy given what we, we've done uh, before. I mean, those, those many assumptions are just the assumption uh, to treat the, the representation of S mod T as a gamma space. Uh, For L trivial, uh, we have map uh, S mod T uh, Oh, just sorry, I like it. Consider S mod T as my X and consider it as a gamma representation. Uh, this is amenable and uh, metrically ergodic, uh, so it implies that there exists some H uh, and a map X S mod T to G mod H. And I want now to view it as a map from S. And here I will uh, act by uh, uh, G times the trivial group. Okay, so uh, I have, in this complicated category of representation, I have these two theorems. And now, from now on, I will assume I will not even give a name for the, to the local field. You can think of S as to be a, a simple Lie group. I want it to be a, a, a non-compact simple uh, algebraic group, maybe over another field than K, on which G is defined. Maybe it's over the reals. Uh, so this will be a standing assumption for me now. Let me put it in color. <coughs> Yes, please. The previous theorem, could they be true for something, for gamma not relative? I mean, are they cases? Uh, 
yes. I mean, what we used, I mean, in principle, yes. What we use is that this S mod gamma has a trivial algebraic representation as a, as a T space for every, for every representation. So I know I, I want this property. The only uh, way I know to guarantee it uh, is weekly mixing, but I suppose uh, some other ergodic assumptions can, uh, uh, can be used just as well. Uh, yes, but uh, you, you need, I mean, metric ergodicity, for example, I mean, I, I don't even need gamma to be, uh, uh, sorry, metric ergodicity by itself is not enough. Okay, I mean, we can discuss this, but uh, I suspect that weekly mixing is more than enough. Or maybe I'll add here before, uh, I will always assume that gamma is a lattice. And maybe a remark, uh, many of the things I'm about, about to say also works for semi-simple groups. But we don't care about semi-simple groups anymore. We prove the super rigidity result for product of groups without any linearity assumption on S1 and S2 in the past. So we had this strong uh, uh, theorem for product, so now when Actually, considering uh, Lie groups, I can just as well uh, assume simplicity. So I will assume this and uh, recall for every T in S closed non compact. Uh, gamma on S mod T and, oh, and T on S mod gamma are ME. So this is the, this is the assumption that I'm, uh, I, I, was, I had in those theorems. I get it now for free uh, when now consider only uh, the simple Lie group uh, setting. Okay, question so far. What I'm about to do next is uh, discuss functoriality as we did before in this setting. And again, I, uh, remember how powerful was the simple functoriality that uh, we got out of this abstract setting. So let me be clear about what are the categories that I consider. Uh, first category, also we'll have two categories, categories of ergodic theoretical setup and category of algebraic geometric, algebra or geometrical setup. The, previously, the category of ergodic theo theo theoretical setup was gamma act on various spaces, X and Y. Here, uh, I have the fixed data S and gamma. What will change is the T, is the, the, the right hand player. So, uh, fix uh, S psi gamma as above uh, with all this assumption. Uh, and consider. Um, okay, gamma S actions. So, objects are closed, non compact subgroup T in S. Maybe I'll write it. from the right, more suggestive, because they will act on the right, gamma will act on the left. Uh, and uh, morphisms, maybe this is harder to guess now. Uh, 
So let me uh, put it in a diagrammatic fashion first. So I'm having S. Now I consider only ergodic theoretical sides, right? Not, not representation yet. So I'm having S, and I'm having the gamma action here, and the T action here. Um, and I want to move it, maybe this is T1. And I want to pass to T2, uh, another set of action. Uh, so here, I will take S in S and will act, acting on the right. So when little s will act on the right, that will be a, an equivalent map for the gamma action, which act on the left. It commutes with this. But it will not be equivalent for uh, T. But these are two different players. But it will conjugate the T1 action into uh, uh, T2. If uh, T1, so well, just to be clear, this is x in s move to x s inverse here. Uh, so, uh, so it's s in s such that um, s t1 s inverse, which I will call uh, t1 to the s, is in T2. This is the space of morphisms. And this is how they act. And this condition really uh, says that this is an equivalent uh, thing. OK, so this is the natural thing to consider here af after uh, looking at it uh, for enough time. So this is. Uh, now, a category, if you wish, if you want to uh, use this language, of a representation of gammas uh, and partners on S. And, the, and again, the objects now are just the different partners that gamma might have. Uh, the category of, of G spaces is much simpler. Just put it uh, to be clear. Uh, objects are uh, are uh, V's on which G act. G's G is fixed. So it's the the V here. Uh, and with L, commuting action. So, this and that are the uh, varying data. And uh, morphisms, of course. Uh, you know it, but I'll write it down. Um, v to U, uh, KG map, KG morphism. With, without caring about L equivalence, as I said. Uh, so this is completely algebraic geometric uh, category, and uh, and now uh, the functor. This part, between these two categories,
okay, so we have one object here. Let me put gamma times t one. And I will assign to it, of course, as you may, might guess, uh, g times I have here the map phi1. I don't care about it. The, the functor is the uh, association to S of D space, right? But of course, I have this extra data, the, the map connecting it to phi. Uh, okay. Maybe I'll write it. Okay, that's the gate, N nothing but it. Uh, but this diagram that I'm trying to uh, now uh, illustrate on, on that board uh, explain functoriality for, uh, for maps, which is very important. So assume we have another object, gamma times T2, and a map here given by little s. And corresponding conjugation map. Now this guy comes with another g mod h2 on which g times n and 2 mod h2 act. And of course, everything is connected here in a nice way. Uh, the thing is here that this guy really is a representation of, uh, of that object. So, and, and this is an initial object. So the, there must be such a map because, uh, put the color, this is because of the gate property of, of the first object. That's what being an initial object is all about. Uh, so let's call it maybe theta of s. Is that alpha of s? Theta was used here. I guess that's rho times theta one, rho times theta two. And I used alpha previously for those morphisms. So, but now this alpha depends on this little s. So, uh, or maybe also you can call it, if you, if you are a formalist, you can, and if you think of this as uh, the gate, so this is the gate functor, just, just to be clear. This is the gate functor applies to the morphism little s. Uh, but of course, I, I will use the symbol alpha. Uh, but now, as we had before, uh, we had this uh, very uh, neat, uh, in particular section. No, just, is this clear? It is clear. It is, it is formal. It is uh, nothing uh, too hard. But now we get a non-trivial thing. So we get uh, a map between the automorphism of this gamma s t, okay, now fix one object. Uh, we get a map in particular from the automorphism of this one to the automorphism of uh, g mod h zero, of the gate. Now th this is in particular for a given object. I'm missing some words here when I write. Uh, I apply this for this equals that, for one equals two. Uh, you get this for free, that's, and you get this connecting morphism, alpha. Uh, but now we have interpretation of this. This, okay, this is not entirely, uh, I mean, this sits inside N0 mod H0. I mean, these are all maps that, ah, this is exactly this. 
this is all kg morphism of uh, of v. What is this guy? This is, these are all maps that. Uh, where is this condition? It should be here. All the S's such that when I conjugate T, now T, and T, T1 and T2 is, are the same. When I conjugate uh, T1, I, I'm inside T2. I mean, principle, this is a bit less than uh, norm, uh, normalization, but uh, with whatever, Hopfkopf or whatever. Uh, I mean, for those groups that we study, this is just normalization. Uh, this is the normalizer in S of T. I, 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 maybe I'll emphasize this because now we have too many normalizers. Normalizer in G of H0, mod H0, and we get this map alpha. Now, uh, a bit more explicit than what is written here. This is the non-trivial data that we got. And as before, this is the reception of this homomorphism. Now there is a funny thing. Uh, I didn't divide by anything. This is a true normalizer that I'm getting here. For any element normalizing t, I'm getting a map here. And, and, and this is a non-trivial data. And actually, I mean, the proof was now very, very easy, very, very formal. The ergodic theoretical part in it was this weak, weakly mixing thing that we worked uh, in, the, in the first uh, lecture uh, to explain uh, its... Uh, uh, effect on algebraic representation. I mean, the fact that weakly mixing cannot be algebraically represented. Ah, and of course, uh, this fact here, which is related to how more. These two things together gives me, by pure formalism, uh, this non-trivial connecting homomorphism. And now I will explain how, how can one use it and get a non-trivial result. Questions? Yes. Just a question. So when you say we, so what's behind is how more perfect? You know? Yes. I mean. To assume that S is you know, simply connected, you know, because you have S plus and S. And, uh... Okay. Yes. I need to assume something. Uh, I, I try to avoid those things. Yes. This is how more. And maybe let to avoid this. Let me stick to the Lie group setting. I mean, yes, there is some uh, subtlety here, which yeah, I'm, I'm putting under the rug. Thank you. I mean, how more doesn't work for S not connected. So you need connected, but also connectedness in what sense? I mean, there is the, uh, the risky connected is not enough sometimes. Uh, Typically, you have uh, something called S plus inside S, the group generated by unipotent, which is not S itself. Over algebraically closed fields, uh, things are uh, nice, but sometimes you get some extra complication. Uh, I'm not dealing with it, with it now. This could be uh, settled. Uh, but uh, yes, I want to focus on the ideas and the, the, sim the simplest setting for this. Uh, ah, okay, and uh, maybe I just now add uh, one more line. Uh, maybe it's obvious, but uh, now we get extra invariance. These guys act on this act on S, and this act on G mod H0. And we had the map phi zero. This is the gate map, which was supposed to be, to be gamma times t equivariant. But now I claim that it is, well, it is gamma equivariant, but also it is equivalent under this extra thing. So we, uh, this bigger. So this is extra equivariance. I want to emphasize. And uh, I'll put a corollary now to this. Yeah. 
if T1 and T2 in S normalize each other, then they have the same gate. S to G mod H0, gamma. Rho times theta i. I mean, same guy phi zero could be used for, uh, to illustrate uh, both gates. Why is it so? Say, assume uh, T1 is included into, in T2 and normalized by it. Then uh, what I showed here is that the T1 gate is actually a T2 object. I mean, the map uh, is advanced with respect to T2 as well. Uh, so, and obviously, every T2 object is a T1 object because T2 is included in T1. So uh, again, so if T2 contains T1, maybe this is uh, easier to see, uh, but then apply to T1 and the group generated by T1 and T2, which normalizes T1, and they have the same gate. Also T2 is contained in this and normalized by this, group generated by T1 and T2, it's con it has the same gate, and you get this. Okay, so uh, it's the same map phi. It's actually the same. Yes, it's the same map because that, that's the phenomenon we found here. It's the same map phi zero that uh, is actually uh, more uh, um, respects further equivalence than intended by, by its universal property. It's actually the same map, and this is very, very important. Thank you for asking this, Federic. Um, okay. So, we've been walking, and we got some theorems. So we defined this fancy categorical setting. I'll try to uh, maybe leave this. This might be useful at some point. Uh, we found that under this standing assumption, we always have initial objects. And the initial objects uh, have this extra uh, equivalence uh, for the normalizer. That's what we found. And also, now I uh, managed not to uh, erase, if T is amenable, this initial object is non-trivial. And this is an important starter, as I emphasized many, many times. And now it's time, even before the break, uh, we manage to discuss uh, Margulis' uh, superrigidity, the simple case. So, uh, I'll set the theorem. Let S be high rank. I think everyone here knows what it means, but yes, please. I missed something. So, this theorem, have you provided a proof of it? Yes, I think it is. I, I, I did it very, very fast. Let, let me uh, repeat it. Uh, if T was amenable, then S mod T was amenable gamma space. And we view it as a representation, as a representation of such in, 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 in the setting that we studied earlier. And we find such a non-trivial recipient here. And we view it as a, actually a map from S, which is trivial on T. 
So that's a, a very easy way uh, to do it. Maybe this is the most, not the most efficient way to do it. Maybe I can go down and take another age with the price that t will not be invariant. I mean, the t, the t morphism will not be trivial anymore, but this is an object in the category of such representation which is not trivial. Then the gate, and this is, maybe I'll write it down, this is a non-trivial object. And it implies that the gate uh, is non-trivial. It's just a deeper object. Thank you. So, and, and, and this is really, um, okay. I said this many times. Now let S be a high rank. Uh, I will just take this uh, setting simply group. I need to explain what high rank is. Again, I, I think everyone here knows, but I will give a brief uh, introduction to this. Uh, and gamma inside S, a lattice. And since I'm being simple, I don't need to assume irreducibility. Uh, and let G be K simple. K local field. So really, I, I do want to emphasize that the reception is, uh, is quite arbitrary. I mean, it's defined over an arbitrary local field. And maybe I should say, I mean, this, this could be generalized uh, for local field of any characteristic and also not necessarily local field, but uh, f complete field with absolute values. Uh, and here one should uh, use a work that we've done with uh, uh, Jean Le Courant and Bruno de Champ uh, for this generalization. Uh, but in my exposition, typically K was a, a characteristic zero local field just for simplicity. Uh, and assume we have this rho, which is a risky dense and unbounded. Then, rho extends uniquely to a map from S. That's the formulation. Uh, and uh, now, again, you know what high rank means. Uh, S is simply group. In fact, it is. Uh, you can think of it as an algebraic group over the reals, and this theorem actually applies in a more general setting. But I avoid uh, discussing this. Uh, whenever we have an algebraic group defined over a field, uh, we can look at the maximal split torus in it, whatever that means, uh, and look at its dimension. And that is, by definition, the the rank, the split rank, uh, of the group. And uh, uh, but let me give you, nevertheless, uh, high rank, huh, high rank is just a convenient way to say that the rank is bigger than two. It is not rank one. Rank zero is compactness. Rank one is some very special feature, and rank two is more generic, uh, stabilized feature. Uh, but here it, here it, what, here is a, uh, this fact now is an equivalence formulation of higher rank, which is what I'm about to use. Uh, there exists T1 to Tn such that we have the, both property. Together, they generate S, and Ti commutes with Ti plus one. They, sec they sequentially compute. So this property, maybe, is equivalent to high rank. So high rank is an adjective describing the group S, 
and it is equivalent to this thing over here. Uh, let me uh, illustrate this. Take S to be SL3R and take our groups to be T1, T2, and T3. I'll take them to be uh, the group consisting of parts. I mean, the, the, here there are root groups, and these three uh, are the ones that. Uh, generate together the, high, the standard Heisenberg group. Yes. Ah, uh, billion, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that was too trivial so far. Uh, Non-compact subgroup. I mean, amenable will be enough for applications. In fact, amenability of T1 will be enough for applications, but definitely. Uh, and also, uh, norm normalization will be enough for applications. Uh, but just to get, uh, but really, high rank is equivalent to this one. And I'm, again, continuing to illustrate this. Uh, we have T1, T2, T3. This is part of a six groups of root groups in SL3R. Uh, and this triple uh, generates a Heisenberg group. This is the center of this Heisenberg group. So it commutes with this one, and it commutes with this one. But now uh, I'll add a, a fourth group. It will be that one. This triple is the same as this triple up to conjugation. Just uh, renumerate uh, your columns and uh, up to conjuga conjug uh, conjugation by uh, an action of S3, conjugation by permutation. Uh, so also, this is the center of that uh, relevant Heisenberg group. And uh, you have commutation here and here. And same holds for the next T5 and T6. And in fact, also, uh, this one commutes with th that one. And if you, haven't, if you haven't seen this before, just check it. Um, so this kind of trick, this is a, a game we played with uh, root groups. You can do always, if you know, I mean, you can, in fact, you can take this as definition of higher rank if you haven't seen this. If you saw it, definition of higher rank, definition of a rank, you can prove it. Another way, uh, another candidate is, will be uh, not to use uh, Unipotent groups, as I used here, but take uh, singular elements in tori. You always have Cartan groups, which are uh, two-dimensional or higher, and I can take singular things in them, and the singular things will commute with others, and commutation, by, by such commutation, you can go all over the place. Uh, if you want the symmetric space or the corresponding building, uh, you can move on it uh, via singular uh, elements and uh, change your apartment, uh, change your flat, and go all, all over the place. So the, the smallest n, uh, given s, the smallest n is some, uh, uh, you know, it's related to the root numbers? I, I suppose, I, I suppose if, yeah. you, if, you take, if you take, if you take singular, uh, singular semi-simple element, you can be uh, maybe a bit more efficient, I'm not so sure. If you want to, ro to go over uh, root groups, this is some uh, uh, root space, uh, uh, root system uh, computation. I didn't, I, I never cared about it. Change some groups, can you, can you go down to two or? Sorry? Can you go down to two or? Uh... No, two, two will uh, generate an abelian subgroup. Maybe you can go down to three. I, I, Typically, I think, no, three will have center. The, the, the second will be a center. It will be some Eisenberg group. Maybe four. 
I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, we are well prepared uh, for the proof. It will be very, very easy now. After all this preparation, maybe you can see it by yourself. Let's take a break, and after the break, I'll, I'll give it to you. 12. What shall I keep? Definitely this one. Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, so we stated Magudi super rigidity uh, under the assumption that uh, S is a, a simple equal with higher rank. I explained what higher rank means uh, here, and, um, and now we're ready uh, for the proof. So the thing is that all the TIs, so I'm using the TIs that I presented uh, uh, there in the, in the fact. Uh, and I will use this corollary the, that they normalize each other, they centralize each other. So they have the same gate, each pair. But of course, this goes all over the sequence. So they all have the same gate, uh, all the TIs have the same gate. Let me name it. Mm. So it's S, G mod H, gamma times T i, G times N mod H, connecting homomorphism here, the rho times T i, same thing here. Uh, and now, I want to explain that uh, when I mod out n here, so n mod h act here, and when I mod out n, of course I'm getting g mod n, but then all the ti uh, uh, group cancel, so this is s mod the group generated by ti, which will be mapped here. But of course, uh, I have the assumption that Ti generate S. So this is just uh, a point. So uh, it means that uh, N is G. All right, I mean, this point, uh, the image, um, um, I'll just uh, say, the image is a gamma invariant point in here. Hence, it is invariant under the Zariski closure of gamma, which is G itself. So there is a, a G invariant point in here, uh, which implies this coset space is trivial. Okay, so uh, this is a trick that we've seen many times before. So uh, I've got that one. But uh, I haven't used amenability. Uh, in fact, I'm using the fact that T1 uh, is amenable as uh, Jean uh, said. And um, this is enough to show that uh, age uh, is non-trivial uh, in G by this theorem. <coughs> um, but ah, this one implies that age is normal in G, right? and is a normalizer of H by definition. This is not written anywhere on the board, but uh, this is our standard co conve convention uh, regarding the notation. Uh, and we got now that H is actually a trivial group. Okay, so now I'm in a position uh, to rewrite this uh, with H being a trivial group. And, uh, and I'll call this part now already Pretty soon uh, we are in the end game, and uh, I want us to remember this because this end game we will use uh, again in a, in a different context later. Uh, so let me summarize what we have. We have uh, this map phi is in fact uh, a map from S to G itself. Remember this this is a map between two groups, but it is not a homomorphism a priori. It is just a measurable map. And here we have gamma times ti's. 
And here we have the G times G action and the map rho times theta i that in the background we have all these maps ti to g itself. And remember the ti's do generate s. So we have like a partial homomorphism, I mean many partial homomorphisms which are all over the place. So we just have to integrate them together somehow into one homomorphism from S uh, to G. And uh, <clears throat> this is what I, I, I will do next. Mm. Okay, so uh, in order to do so, I mean, that's, now it's kind of easy, but I want to show uh, how, to, how we actually can do that. I'll, I'll look at a, a polynomial, uh, k-valued polynomial functions on G, that's an algebra, and I will take the map into measurable functions from S to K. That's an alge algebra, or classes of functions to be precise. Uh, so that's phi star. And uh, so, the, so we have this uh, homomorphism of algebras with, with same equivalence as we had before. And I want to... Uh, observe that uh, the Z support, so if you take the measure here on S and you map it to G, I can take the support of the image in G. That's a measure class. Oh, somehow, I mean, that I can push uh, a priori, but uh, I have a well-defined support of this measure and it will be gamma invariant. Again, gamma for a subset invariance means uh, G invariance. Uh, so it is everything. This means that this map over here is injective. If you have a polynomial here which vanishes uh, on the support, I mean, which, which image, image is zero here, it means it vanishes on the support, and we cannot have such a thing. So um, it's a nice thing now that I can actually identify this algebra as a sub-algebra of this piece. On this algebra, I have uh, left and right actions of G, and on this algebra, I have the gamma and Ti actions, but also have the S action on the right. So somehow, by this injectivity, I can recognize the S-action here as an S-action here. So, uh, phi star kg, if you want to be formal, and again, I, I think of it as a sub-algebra uh, of, uh, of kg itself, as a sub-algebra of uh, this guy, is ti invariant for all ti, Hence, it is S invariant. Uh, and this gives an S action uh, on, on KG itself, extending the TI actions. Simultaneously. Uh, and all the TIs here, they act on G on the right. So I'm getting uh, S acts on G on the right. I'm getting a map S to G, which is theta. And actually this diagram here, S to, okay, that's, I have maps, this is a homomorphism. And I had this fit, this was not a homomorphism a priori, uh, but now I'm having gamma times S and G times G, and this is a homomorphism, rho time theta, and we've been here before. 
we've seen that if we, if we have such a situation, O extends, as before. We've seen that actually uh, rho extends to a certain conjugation of theta. Uh, we, we use the same lemma. Somehow we didn't frame it as a lemma, but we use the, frame le lemma, the same lemma uh, several times in the proof of uh, the superagility for products. And this is it. We've proved it. Any question? So that was a bit un anticlimactic. Uh, it's too easy. Uh, but uh, now we have a, a, a super rigidity for higher rank, and uh, we might ask for more. What about rank one? So uh, from now on, I will assume that. Uh, S is a simple non-compact P group of rank one. So everything is just the same, only we don't have that fact that we use dramatically. Um, but I, 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 now I want to discuss what can be saved. <clears throat> so, is there any question about uh, the setting? So I, I want, I said this is the end game and I want to use it. So maybe I'll just uh, now uh, rephrase it as a lemma. If S is generated by a bunch of Ti's, they need not to commute at this point. If I get uh, such a diagram, then I get extension. So uh, in my mind, I'm under, I, mean, I will not write it completely, I'm under this, the assumption of uh, Margulis superrigidity, only, uh, so I'm, I'm assuming having rho with all this property. I wish to get extension of rho, uh, but I do not assume a, a higher rank anymore, that's the game, and I'm trying to, say, to see what I can save. So what extra assumptions do I need to, to finish? So assume uh, this, maybe let's do recall it. I have this, the dance. And I have this setting. Target is G now. And I have G times G and various theta i's um, which are homomorphisms, so I have partial homomorphisms from S, but global measurable map, right? That's the, the data. Uh, and we got we had a little computation showing that uh, rho extends to S. So now, uh, in, the, in the rank one case, I don't have uh, enough commuting uh, uh, unipotents. But still, uh, I just covered it. Uh, I have this uh, lemma says that uh, when I, whenever I have an amenable group, I can uh, try to start something on. Uh, so uh, I will now try to uh, discuss what happens for a, a amenable subgroup, in particular for the minimal parabolic, for, for, for the parabolic subgroup in S. But before this, let me. Um, add a piece of notation, denote for T and S uh, the T gate, because I will play with some, uh, I will use S to G mod H sub T 
and that will be phi sub t, and uh, here we'll have gamma times t to g times n mod ht, or n t mod ht. And the map here I will use, I will call theta sub t, okay? Just so we're, I can play with various t and uh, study the relations. And the most prominent t, uh, in particular, uh, I will consider the parabolic, or a parabolic. They are all conjugated. We have only one non-trivial, uh, because I'm assuming rank one. But also I will uh, use t to be a or u, etc. And we understand what uh, those are, right? This is the split torus. This is the maximal unipotent subgroup inside p, uh, etc. Standard notation. And uh, here is a lemma that I can uh, squeeze from what happened. If for the parabolic, this age is trivial, so I'm sort of in this situation, then rho extends. Is my notation clear? Is it clear what I'm proving now? So I'm assuming that the gate map for P, when T is P, the gate map is to G itself. G is the recipient of the gate map. So, consider phi A. The thing is that, uh, so I'm having a S to G mod H A. I'll also have S to G mod HP, which is just G. This is, this is phi P, this is phi A, right? But since A is, is in P, this is also a P, a, an, an A map. And this is the gate, so I'm getting this. So HA, is inside HP, and this forces AJ to be trivial too. Uh, but now, P, observe, P did not have a normalizer. P is its own normalizer. So applying this corollary that we had before for P didn't give us anything. But when I restrict it to A, I get just a little bit more. I get the vile element, which normalizes it. Uh, and this means also, uh, but now phi A is phi of the normalizer in S of A. That's the corollary over there. Uh, and H, the normalizer of A then is trivial. And what we get really is that uh, this map here, I mean, they, they all end up here. It's the same thing, phi all over again. Uh, but I have gamma and ti for t1, which is p, and t2, which is the normalizer of a. And these two, P and the vile element, they generate. So by this extension lemma, I'm done. Okay, so if I'm lucky and I consider the P representation and it's as big as it could, then I'll be good. Okay, it's, you need to be lucky here. Uh, it's a 
You need some miracle to happen. It's, you will not get it for free because we know that there is no super rigidity in, in general in rank one groups. Uh, but sometimes miracles do happen. And uh, I, I want to discuss such a situation. Um, so I, I will discuss a, a certain condition which you, you might think is a bit unnatural. It's, it is the miracle. Uh, so I will just discuss it formally first and explain it geometrically later, if I, if I have time. Uh, assume there exists W inside S, uh, which is a simple group by itself. So typically S is S O N 1 in our game. Maybe W is S O M 1 for M smaller than, than N. Uh, and assume that uh, by this miracle I'm uh, considering, I can find such a representation of a gamma representation of S mod W for H non-trivial. That's the thing. That's a gamma rep, as we discussed last time. And Let's, let me call this condition star. This condition stars uh, imply that uh, U is not in the kernel of the P representation. It's a bit technical what I'm writing. I considered a certain condition, technical condition, and I got myself a technical uh, result. I'm having the P representation that we discussed before and associated with each representation. Mm, where did I put the notation? Uh, associated with each representation. I had a uh, theme, maybe I didn't uh, emphasize it enough. This went from T to NT mod uh, HT. And in P, I have the unipotent radical, and I, I, I claim that it is not, uh, it, it cannot be uh, fully in the kernel. <clears throat> the proof is easy. I mean, once you uh, understand uh, all the technical notations, uh, so let me give it to you. I'll, I'll consider U prime, which is the corresponding unipotent radical of W. So I'll take W and intersect it with U. W is a, is a simple E group by itself, so this is non-compact. So theta P is a map from? Theta P is a map from a P, P to a, now I don't know what it is. I, I, now I'm not under the assumption here. It's for something here. And I ask myself this question. I, I really uh, am consider, uh, I'm curious by this question. And I find myself a, a very complicated uh, star condition uh, answering this question sometimes in, in the negative. Well, NP is the normalizer of P? NP is the normalizer of HP, yes. Oh. Yes, it's a... Uh, uh, P is an index here, uh, yeah. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, the notation gets uh, a bit cumbersome here, but... Uh, um, okay, let, let, me, let me move on, uh, unless... Uh, sorry. I, I, I wish to clarify questions, I don't want to give, to give the, the wrong impression. Uh, okay, so now the thing is that there is a, it's a very strong assumption that W is simple and it means that it has unipotence by itself. It, uh, and 
the unipotent radical uh, of U is just of a parabolic. The intersection of W with P will be a parabolic uh, with W. Uh, or maybe there is a conjugation uh, that I need to, to do here. Uh, and uh, U prime will be the unipotent radical of parabolic in W. So this is uh, non-compact. And the thing is now that uh, oh, if I'm in SON1, by the way, U is just a, a vector space. Uh, it's a billion. U prime is normal in U. And U is normal in P. If I'm in uh, SU and 1, maybe, uh, the, 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 maybe U is more complicated. It's a two-step nilpotent. In fact, this is the, the case always. But the thing is that if I go uh, for normalizer of normalizer of normalizer of U, I think three steps should be enough always, uh, maybe four, uh, I will just get P. So uh, P is the normalizer of the normalizer of the normalizer uh, the normalizer, let me be safe, uh, um, so, and all, these guys all have uh, by, I guess it's here, uh, this guy all have the same gate. So it's, um, we already discussed it. This is, this is why this, uh, I emphasize so much this HP. Mm. This is VP. By the way, uh, so this goes for U. For A, we don't get it for free. A is not normal in P. So we need this uh, strong assumption, maybe it's here. We need this strong assumption here of triviality to get that for A and P, we get the same gate. But for you, it's free. And for subset of you, it's free. Yes, please. Uh, do you need a specific property on U prime to get this uh, P equal iterative normalizer? No. Because I know it's... construction which is taking normalizer on the length of the unipotent radical. Uh, maybe, um, maybe you need to go down yeah, to, uh, to groups normalizer by. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure now. Okay, um, and this is an approximation. Uh, I'm not sure now. But the thing is that I claim that U prime, by, uh, by taking normalizer and maybe go down to things normalized by, by no, but non compact things, and go up again and go down if necessary, eventually uh, you get P. Thank you for this uh, uh, clarifying question. Uh, the thing is that you can get P. Actually, I'm having in mind SON1, and now uh, just two normalizers will be enough. Um, and, but this is, this is the important thing that you get out of uh, pure uh, algebra. Uh, and, but uh, the thing is, you should, uh, I, I want to emphasize it. In rank one, somehow, the thing is that you cannot go out of a parabolic unless you're on A. A took us out for the parabolic, it gave us one extra element, which is the vile element, which is enough now to generate everything. That was the, the uh, previous lemma. But usually, if I'm just unipotent and I'm playing this game of going to normalizer and get, getting something which are normalized by, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I'm stuck in a parabolic. If I could move out, I would get full super rigidity. It's this algebraic technique, which is completely the, the op op opposite of that one, uh, of high rank, that, uh, forces somehow the, the non-rigidity-ness of uh, rank one groups. Uh, but this I got, and uh, let me just consult my notes because I'm uh, out of focus. Uh, so uh, phi u prime is phi u, is phi p. And uh, so I'll write it. Uh, S to uh, G mod HP and uh, gamma times uh, P. Or maybe uh, I'll go by, I, I'll assume now that U is in the kernel of uh, theta P and I'll show that uh, star cannot hold. And I'll and, and assume star, 
and try to uh, derive a contradiction. Okay? So, uh, just, where am I? Uh, so I have gamma times p here, and I have uh, g times np mod hp. Again, I'm, I apologize for cumbersome notation. Um, and here I have s mod w. I mean, now I'm, I'm, I'm plugging here star, and this is g mod h for some h, non-trivial, recall. Uh, and and u prime is in here, right? So this is u prime invariant. This map, I mean, this map here, is u prime invariant. In particular, it's some representation of u prime. And this is the gate of u prime. So I'm getting that. Mm. But now, um, is, is this clear? I used, sorry, I, I didn't tidy it down. That's, I consider this as a u prime map, u, u prime rep, in a trivial way. And I use this as u prime gate. And by this I got this g map. Uh, but now I have that u, all u, uh, is in the kernel here. I'm going to get another color. Uh, and now I'm using this assumption. This map is uh, equivalent with respect to p, and u is in the kernel. So this map now factor from this. And altogether, we get at this map from here to here, S to G mod H is both W and U invariant. But W and U, again, uh, in W, uh, I mean, it's W invariant because it's factored through here. In W, I have the vial element. And with U, uh, and, and also I have A. So I have U and W, and I, I don't need A. U, and with W, I have the opposite of U, they generate. So I have S. So again, I have a, an S invariant map in here. It goes here, and we show that this implies H equals G. I mean, this is our general, strat general theme. We did it many times, contradicting that one. And I got a contradiction. OK. So it's, it's nice. It's uh, definitely a, a <laughs> we proved something. But uh, what did we prove? It's maybe not clear. Um, so. Let me now uh, give you some discussion and, and, and explain wh when, when this becomes a bit relevant. Um, before, maybe let me give a, a very little uh, observation. Uh, K is non Archimedean, then U is certainly in the kernel of whatever map I have. Uh, right? I mean, because U is connected and NP mod HP.
is, is a K group. It's totally disconnected. So uh, I always have this, and I get that star cannot hold for free. So I mean, we have star. We didn't discuss again, uh, yet what is the meaning of this uh, star. Uh, but uh, it, it cannot hold if S is a real group and uh, G is a non archimedean group. So we, we already got something uh, trivial, uh, maybe non-trivial, but out of really uh, general nonsense. Uh, and also I'll add another uh, definition. When that becomes uh, important, I'll say that G is compatible with S if for every H, which is a non trivial subgroup of uh, G, uh, and for every theta from P to a normalizer of H mod H, U is in the kernel of theta, like in the non archimedean case. This is trivial. I mean, this holds trivia trivially, as I, as I observed here. Um, so I'll, I'll give it a name. I'll give it the name for, uh, for every uh, E of this sort. And I get a corollary, corollary that star plus comp compatibility implies that row extends. Why? Uh, in the definition of compatibility, I explained that. Uh, I, I, I took the uh, star means star cannot live with uh, U uh, in the kernel, which is compatibility. But in the definition of compatibility, I uh, allowed uh, H to be trivial. But if H is trivial, we are here in this lemma. And then we get extension. OK? So. So this might uh, be look technical, but it, uh, I mean sometimes it's applied in nature. So this is why we have this. And uh, I want now to, to focus, uh, I mean to, to freeze this picture and to discuss the. Sorry, change the subject now, and I, I will discuss relations between super rigidity and arithmeticity, and then I will go back to this and say how, and, and explain how this could be applied in some, applied in some situations. Uh, so now. New subject, very briefly, relation to arithmeticity. So S is SR. It's the re real point of an algebraic group in our consideration. Uh, and I assume. It is not SL2R itself. Now, for this discussion, uh, S could be either rank one or higher rank. I'll take a lattice, so then uh, irreducible. A lattice. And here is a fact. There gamma is defined over a number field. There exists a number field L, uh, which is embedded into the reals. So um, gamma is a, is a group of matrices. Up to conjugation, I can put them inside, an, I mean, with real coefficients. 
up to conjugation, and I can put them inside a certain number of fields, called the trace field of gamma, uh, such that S, first of all, or maybe the group S, uh, is defined over this little field L. I have already an algebraic structure for, uh, for the algebraic group S over, over little L. Uh, and gamma is in the L points. Up to conjugation, yes, up to finite index. Thank you, Greg. Now, I will phrase something that uh, should be called Margulis arithmeticity criterion. <clears throat> Gamma is arithmetic if and only if uh, its image is pre-compact uh, in any other place. Or in any place other than I0. I'll explain. Uh, this means that uh, whenever you take L and embed it into some K, local field, real or not, I mean, this could be the reals, the complex, periodic numbers, uh, then either If I take gamma and view it in here and view this in SK uh, is pre-compact. Oh, I, ca I call it bounded earlier. Uh, or this J is this I0 that I started with. Or Not only that K is the reals, but it's actually the same way to embed L into the reals that I'm having here. Yes, please. So you have some minimal key property on L? Is it, you, you do it for a particular number field? I do it for a particular number field called the trace field. Right, right, yes. Uh, uh, exist unique minimal. Yes. Thank you. Now, now I want to explain very briefly, I don't have much time, and I still want to say something new there uh, and connect some dots, but I, I, I really need to uh, explain one thing, and this is how super rigidity implies arithmeticity uh, given this criterion. Super rigidity implies arithmeticity. The thing is that I, I will take I will take G to be S and just make it a joint. Basically, I'm taking G to be S. So I'm having I know super rigidity. I know things for every G, and I want to prove my goal is, I want to prove that gamma. I have gamma, as in there. It, it has this extension property. I want to prove this to show that gamma is arithmetic. Okay? So I, I, I test it over all uh, embedding case, basically. Um, so for every, for every L 
to k, uh, I will do gamma goes to SL goes to SK. And here I have uh, SR. That's the I0 thing. That's the usual embedding. This is, this is what I called S. Maybe I'll go back to like this. And I will get this by super rigidity. Right? And, uh, and this, one can walk out and see that this implies that, ah, sorry. Either uh, gamma precompact which is what I need in the criterion, or I have this applica application. But if gamma is not precompact and I have this, then uh, this implies, now uh, I wanted to, uh, to explain that maybe I, uh, not use too much time, but by a little argument of Borel and Tietz, this implies that uh, I is J. So this is how uh, Mar uh, Margulis prove arithmeticity out of his super rigidity thing. And in fact, this criterion, uh, I attributed it to Margulis, I think is easy, the first one to use it. But uh, there is a, I was in Margulis' birthday, I think it was a, whatever, a birthday. Uh, and uh, uh, Mosto, uh, let's do not talk about age, but Mosto was uh, explaining there, then, up and so, he, he left, but, uh, he, was, uh, he had a, a session and he just interviewed all the big guys in the audience and, and asked them, uh, doing his talk about the history, to explain their point of view, etc. And uh, he asked Mosto about uh, this uh, event when Margulis uh, was supposed to, uh, I mean, won the Fields Medal, but, but he couldn't uh, let go from Russia to, to pick the Fields Medal. And then uh, Mosto explained Margulis' work and it was communicated only very tiny part of the work, and it was explained, basically he explained why super rigidity by Margulis uh, proves uh, arithmeticity, uh, which uh, I guess was uh, known to people uh, working on the, on, on the subject. Uh, so it, it was a very nice event. I, I wish it was videoed. I think it was not. I'm sure it was not. Um, but now, uh, okay. Back to uh, our reality, uh, you see that this proof of uh, super rigidity implies uh, uh, arithmeticity is very uh, not uh, not tight. Super rigidity is just telling us something about all possible targets, and here we we need uh, only need only few targets, uh, G, uh, Gs. Basically, uh, the G is just S. Or maybe you take a form of S defined over L, so you, you go down and then you extend to another local field. But it's those algebraic groups that pops here are, are just a, a, a very uh, restricted class of uh, groups that we need to uh, have uh, rigidity with these kind of targets in order to achieve arithmeticity. So there is a, a hope to get arithmeticity even if we don't, we don't have super rigidity. And in rank one, I, I remind you, we don't have super rigidity usually. I mean, there are rank one groups with super rigidity, which are super rigid. I, I will not uh, have time to discuss this, I see. But, uh, but what about SON1, for example? Uh, <laughs> So now uh, I want to discuss in the last few minutes, I just want to give you a very brief uh, story and relate back to this condition star and uh, compatibility uh, where one can do proof arithmeticity. So, uh, so this is, I'm talking about recent work. Uh, with 
Fischer, Miller and Stover. <clears throat> and, and we proved the, the following proposition. Uh, if on the group S mod K, K is maximal compact subgroup in S. So S mod K is rank one uh, symmetric space. And this is a manifold or an orbifold of finite volume. There exist infinitely many uh, totally geodesic subspaces not geodesic but, uh, real uh, totally geodesic subspaces uh, this if this exists then condition star sorry Immersed, yes. Uh, immersed, and if we are being pedantic, uh, maximal. Uh, I mean, not everything is happening in a, in a sub-manifold. Uh, then a star, ho star holds for a G's relevant to arithmeticity. So we proved this. Uh, I will not discuss uh, this proof, but surely not now. Uh, but, the, but the proof here is, uh, is an application of a uh, Ratner style theorem. Uh, Moses Shah, I think, and uh, Danny Margulis. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's not, I mean, it's uh, an application of uh, known stuff, uh, usually, but, uh, here is an easy corollary of this. Right away, coming from this observation over there, it shows that uh, our gamma cannot be represented uh, when you prove uh, Margulis uh, arithmeticity criterion in, into PID groups. Because uh, then the compatibility uh, thing hold. Uh, so uh, gamma, is defined over uh, a number ring. So it's integral. It's defined over Z, not over Q. Um, or the analog of uh, L and O. I don't know however we want to uh, write it down. And uh, and now, really, uh, in the last minutes, let me explain something uh, related. This is an exercise. Now, in this theory, um, for n, for more, and S being SO in one, SC, which is basically SO enough or enough, or maybe some parity issue that you have to fix here, here uh, is compatible. If you take for G this group, then you get compatibility. I claim. I mean, and this is uh, compatibility. Where is it written? Is is something? This is not related to a Gothic uh, theory or anything or anything that we did here. This is some Lie theoretical thing that one has to check. And here, for S O N one, it happens 
that uh, you're always compatible when you try to apply Margulis uh, super rigidity. And, uh, and you get, where is the corollary that I wrote at some point? Somewhere uh, I wrote that uh, uh, you get that uh, if there exactly exist infinitely many uh, TGs, then gamma is arithmetic. This is a theorem. And it really follows from uh, whatever is on the board now. I, I <laughs> where, where, where? Ah, corollary up there. Thank you, Fanny. Uh, so this follows from the corollary on the upper left corner. And, um, and also, uh, maybe extra care need, needed for n equals 3. But also it works for n equals 3. Um, just maybe uh, we wrote a paper, and my, my terminology here is not completely compatible with the terminology in the paper. Our compatibility criterion that we uh, use in the paper is not the one uh, that I, I put here. The, one, the compatibility criterion here is a bit uh, simplification. So we rework the compatibility criterion. It's a bit more technical, but it's something that still holds for n equals 3, and uh, it's strong enough to get, uh, so it's a bit of a weaker condition, still hold for n equals 3, uh, but it's strong enough to get the corollary. So. But the compatibility, don't you need more than this? So these are the only groups you need? These are the only groups you need. Ah, okay. Yes. To arithmetic uh, Because you go down to L, and then you go up to uh, p addicts, but p addicts is not a problem, I explained. Or you go back to the reals, and then you might get many complicated groups. But uh, if you go up to the complex numbers, you, you get just that, and, and, and this is, uh, um, and, and you get, I mean, it's enough to uh, go all the way up to complex numbers here. And, and uh, by this, you get compatibility for all possible groups. Uh, so, uh, my time is almost, almost up. Uh, so, I'll just say remarks about uh, SUN1. Or maybe very briefly, now I will not write anymore. Uh, very, very briefly. Uh, so, rank one groups uh, comes in uh, four flavors. They are isometric group of uh, real, complex, quaternionic or octanionic uh, spaces, octanionic plane in the case of, uh, uh, in the last case. Um, and uh, we know that the two last families are super rigid and, uh, I mean, lattices there, hence arithmetic. And lattices in SON1, I explained that uh, are arithmetic if you have infinitely many totally geodesics. And uh, for SUN1, uh, it was open for a while, and the two teams, I mean, us and also uh, uh, Ulmo and Baldi were here, uh, Emmanuel and Greg, uh, they uh, proved it uh, with a different uh, proof. Uh, we, we struggled a bit because uh, then we don't have compatibility. Not always have compatibility, we, we almost all always have compatibility. We don't have compatibility for the complex numbers, but then by Simpson's theory, you don't need, uh, you, I mean, your field is totally real. You, uh, your field L is totally real, and you don't have complex numbers uh, to deal with. Uh, so we need compatibility for the reals only. And for the reals, you, you happen to work with SUPQ. Uh, P plus Q equals N plus 1. And uh, then also, if, if the PQ are more than 2, or the 2 or more, then you do have compatibility, and everything is fine. And the only thing you have to, pl uh, to play against is uh, the target group, G, is SUN1 itself, but with a different uh, field embedding of uh, L. Uh, and then you have to squeeze a bit more from the theorems and to understand, to play a bit more those games that we played uh, for, the, for two weeks now, uh, and to, get the, the, to squeeze out of this extra information, 
some uh, invariance of, of some incidence relations, and eventually we were able to use a result by uh, Beatrice Posetti that uh, was visiting here uh, this week as well, and um, about uh, showing, she, she showed that every uh, map from, uh, every boundary map that uh, preserved uh, uh, Cartan's incidence relation in the boundary of SUN1 must uh, be uh, rational, and we plug this, I mean, out of our techniques, we squeezed eventually the condition to apply her theorem, and from her result, one easily deduced again uh, the relevant uh, super rigidity, and this solves uh, the arithmetic history altogether. So we have this also for SUN1, and we have, a, uh, and there is a companion paper by uh, Emmanuel and uh, Greg, and uh, this is the end of my talk, so thank you very much. Questions? Yeah, yeah. For the other, I don't see group of Albanian and Albanian. You have the same. Uh, for the other, for the super rigidity of the other identical group of Y and So we have the full, uh, I mean, for SPN1. Uh, no, uh, no, we didn't carry the detail for SPN1. Uh, no, uh, actually, this is very interesting for me. For SPN1, we should have uh, super rigidity with no assumptions. I mean, with no uh, totally geodesic uh, manifold assumption. I don't know how to achieve it. I, I looked at it a lot uh, and still uh, didn't get the answer. I, I, I believe that uh, looking some more uh, will reveal maybe extra structure, but uh, uh, yes. And uh, just to say, uh, the, the Baldi-Ulmo uh, paper is using also this uh, Margulis uh, arithmetic criterion, uh, but from then on, this is a completely different uh, techniques that uh, you will maybe hear from others. Yeah. I'm trying to understand it. It's, it's very beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, well, for, for the integrality, we there is something alternative in the cohomology theory. Uh, for uh, integrality for SUN1, uh, yes, uh, is, it could be deduced from a previous result as well. Uh, you don't need. Uh, yeah, no, no, it's uh, half, half very recent results. Very, very yeah, well, uh, yeah, our techniques give it very, very easily, but very differently uh, somehow. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.